University of Japan, uh, Robert Dejarek uh, from the Institute for Contemporary Asian Studies here. Uh, just a few things. Uh, uh, if you have your mobile, just turn it on vibrate, or silent, off, or whatever. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, if you didn't get an invitation directly from us, uh, give us your business card and we'll put you on our email list. And also, if you want to continue to enjoy great programs, uh, you can contribute to our ballot box. We, we, you can show where our ballot box is, where you can put cash, not ballots, because uh, as I always like to point out, we're not a democracy, so, uh, but do, do contribute. Uh, and um, we're extremely happy to have uh, Michael Chuchek with us. Uh, he is one of the leading political commentators on Japan, on Japanese politics. Um, many of you are familiar with, the, with his blog, uh, and if you're not, you should. Uh, he has been in Japan for a few since years. Since 94. Since 94, 18 or 19? Okay. Uh, and uh, he will uh, enlighten us on the outlook for the Abbey cabinet and the House of Councillors election. So, um, as we like to say, brevity is a soul of wit for me, not for you. So, uh, you, you will speak for about 30 minutes. Um, so, the floor is yours without further ado. Thank you again, Michael. people I know and it's good to see you and there are a lot of friendly faces of people I don't know and it's good to see you and uh, if there are any of my enemies out there uh, I'm a Catholic so it's good to see you too uh, um, the uh, topic tonight is uh, the Abe cabinet and the uh, House of Councillors election that we have coming up this July uh, about uh, two and a half months ago, uh, Robert, well not two and a half, two months ago, uh, Robert uh, wrote me an email and said, why don't you give a talk <coughs> here at Temple? And I said, okay. And, uh, well, what am I going to talk about? And I said to myself, uh, well, I have a reputation uh, deserved of being skeptical or in fact uh, antagonistic toward Abe Shinzo and uh, members of his uh, group within the LDP, and also toward the LDP itself. And I thought, well, I best had to do something with a positive message, because there I'd have to be challenging myself, and I'd have to be challenging the conventional wisdom. Uh, we have to remember that not so many months ago, Abe Shinzo was yesterday's man. He was someone who was running for the president of the LDP and everyone was laughing and saying, what does this dinosaur think he's doing? What is he coming back for? Doesn't he know that nobody wanted him and nobody wants him? Well, it's a bit different now. And, uh, two and a half, even two and a half months ago for me to, to start thinking, well, maybe I should say, say that this, is, this has a, a really good outlook for it, this, this new organization, this new uh, cabinet. Uh, at that time, it still looked kind of iffy. However, uh, since then, I should go. Thanks. Uh, things have gone rather well for Mr. Abe and company. Uh, we had uh, a very, very serious step down, true only on paper, uh, by the Bank of Japan, uh, committing itself to a two percent, uh, a two percent inflation rate. We had an, a uh, rather interesting incident at sea, purportedly. We will never probably know the exact nature of it, involving a, a Chinese vessel and a uh, MSDS SF destroyer. 
Uh, we had what seems to be have been a cordial and productive meeting in Washington between President Obama and Mr. Abe just recently. And we had, in something that you could only expect that someone paid North Korea to do, uh, <laughs> had a nuclear test that was quite successful. Uh, all of this uh, has uh, ended up in boosting uh, Mr. Abe's uh, standing. He has also enjoyed a remarkable run economically. Uh, everyone has probably seen this kind of image. Uh, the blue is the, the actual numbers and the, the red and green are the trend lines. But uh, in terms of market response to the arrival of the Abe cabinet, uh, Mr. Abe cannot in any way complain and indeed must be laughing every day about it. And in terms of the uh, conversion factor between the yen and the U.S. dollar, uh, the U.S. dollar is doing exactly what it's supposed to be. It's getting stronger and stronger and stronger vis-a-vis -vis the yen. Again, this, was, this is all something that a few months ago no one could see coming. In addition, uh, Mr. Abe seems to have been able to get his way regarding major appointments. We have just today the nomination of uh, Kurodo uh, Haruhiko as the new Bank of Japan governor. And this seems to be rather than uh, un very unlike what happened five years ago with uh, the uh, Shirakawa appointment, uh, this is going to just sail right through, it seems the uh, House of Representatives and the, and the House of Councillors, <coughs> despite the fact that the LDP and its ally, the new Komeito, do not formally con control the House of Councillors. Nevertheless, this appointment, which was very carefully stage managed, if, you, if I may add, this was not, Mr. Kuroda is our man, this is, Mr. Kuroda is going to be the new Bank of Japan governor, we saw a very deft and very able lifting up of certain candidates, first, let's say, Tanaka, Takenaka Hazel, or then uh, former Vice Finance Minister Muto as candidates, and watching them get shot down. And then it seemed that this man, whom I identified as the, the candidate back in December, uh, seems to be the consensus. This kind of stage managing of appointments was not visible and did not exist when Abe was the uh, uh, prime minister or his success during the, the times of his successors. This was a very skillful, politically skillful appointment. I'm very glad that uh, Mr. Dujari asked me to do this uh, presentation at the end of February. Our first plan was to do this in January, then the date slipped, and then it was mid-February, and now it's the very last day of February. And I am grateful because so much has happened in this short amount of time that has reversed or completely stunned everyone. And for me, this development of just this week is the most stunning of all, the passage of the supplementary budget. The new Kometo and the LDP do not control the House of Councillors. Nominally, there is no way that this budget would have passed through the House of Councillors. It should have gone to a supermajority in the House of Representatives. But instead, Abe Shinzo made the deals. If you look at how this vote happened, and the vote, as you can see, was extremely close, showing again tremendous political savvy, 117 to 116, just <laughs> okay, uh, I agree, whatever it was. Uh, if we look at how that victory was, was cobbled together, which a victory that was sim purely symbolic, true, but nevertheless was beautiful television, we had the uh, new co the LDP, the new Cometo, the Restoration Party, a defector from the DPJ who had defected from the DPJ just a few days before in the first defection. 
Midori no Kaze and independence voting for it. A, uh, pr presumably, and what they thought was a strong uh, and impregnable defense voting against it and some abstentions. And it all worked out so that there was just one vote difference. This, again, is a dramatic and uh, very, very interesting cobbling together of political forces that one would not have expected from Abe just a few months ago. Or at least if one had looked at how Abe had, a, had performed in 2006, 2007, that they would be able to put together not only cutting a deal, but also cutting a deal that blows up other parties. The, the People's New Party, the PNP, it no longer exists as of yesterday. The vote happened. Two, these two gentlemen voted for the uh, voted for the bill, and the party completely evaporated. There's now only one member, uh, Jimmy himself, who's in the party. So that whole experiment of creating a party for, for the postal rebels to live in so that they could then link up with the DPJ, all that is over. And more stunning was this in the alliance with Midori no Kaze. If you had told me in December that Tanyoka Kuriko would be taking a telephone call from Abe and Abe assuring her that she and her people are going to be taken care of, I would have laughed. And then you would have laughed because you would have known it was a joke too. This, uh, for those who are not familiar with Tanyoka Sensei, she is uh, by reputation, if not actually by nature, by reputation someone who is pretty much a, to the political, right next to uh, Fukushima Mizuho of, this, of the Socialist Party. That's her reputation, that Abe Shinzo, revisionist, right-wing, arch-right-wing man, would call her up and say, I need your four votes. Can you, ding, can you bring them to me? And she says, well, can you do something for me? And then she, that she would go before the cameras and proudly say, I made a deal. And now that she's made a deal, is now crowing today that, well, you know, Kuroda, uh, we may not vote for him or you. So it's not necessarily a done deal if the DPJ turns against him. That she thinks that she's a player now that a left-winger is a player in the right-wing, supposedly hard-right world of Abe Shinzo, uh, this is a fascinating development that no one, again, could have expected. And then this. What the heck is going on here? This is from uh, the Sankei Shimbun. It's their, their, uh, a, uh, their various uh, popularity polls of the last few months watching the popularity of Abe Shinzo's cabinet rising in the first few months in contradiction to the general rule which has been for over, well, for nearly a decade, uh, that, the, that uh, prime ministers start strong and then they decay. Here, a prime minister started with a mediocre, uh, well, we're sort of hopeful and we're sort of not view, and suddenly rising time in time again, higher and higher. Of course, Abe Shinzo has been helped in this. He's been helped by things that he couldn't control necessarily, such as the markets and their rises. He certainly could not control the behavior of the Chinese government and uh, Chinese uh, activists and all kinds of other people. But nevertheless, he has benefited, and he and his cabinet have benefited. Now, in terms of the House of Councillors election, what are we going to be looking for? Well, this is again from the Sankei Shimbun, so it, it tends, Sankei Shimbun polls tend to have a bias toward, uh, strangely toward Hashimoto and Ishihara's restoration party that other polls don't have. But nevertheless, this is the most recent and most interesting poll in terms of which party do you intend to vote for in the House of Councilors proportional vote? If you can't read it, I'm sorry. I'll read out the numbers. Um, the LDP tops out at 43% of voters, of uh, respondents. Uh, 
Hashimoto, Ishihara, Shintaro's, uh, JRA, JRP, depending how you talk about it, 13%. The DPJ, 7.6%. Uh, and then the minor parties, New Komeito, whom, as we know, uh, their, their supporters never really actually tell exactly uh, who they're voting for. Your party at 5.2%, it seems to have still have legs, something that's amazing to me. And then the smaller parties fading off into the darkness. Now, with 43%, which is a level that has not been seen in a very, very long time, the LDP is set up, at least in the proportional vote, to go to sweep the table all the way across the, the country with the uh, Japan Restoration Party picking up a few seats here and there and the DPJ getting a very small number. Uh, this is going to be especially uh, damaging for the DPJ because it is defending so many seats. Uh, in this upcoming election cycle, uh, the DPJ is going to try to protect 15 proportional seats, but more painful, 30 district seats. There is no way that they'll hold on to even 10. Uh, the total in play is 45, and that's going to be a big chunk of their power. These numbers, I have asterisks on them. Uh, that these are the numbers before the current defections of uh, two DPJ members are factored in. Uh, the LDP, by contrast, is, has some low numbers, which means it has a lot of room upstairs to pick up seats whenever the election happens. Uh, New Komeito will defend its, its position. Your party will probably pick up seats um, uh, uh, from the DPJ. Uh, Life will probably lose most, of, if not all, of its seats. And the communists will stay the same, the socialists will may get wiped out, may they stay the same. And then uh, down here, this is their current totals for Hashimoto, Nishihara's JRP, JRA. This will obviously go up, but not by much. The J LDP is so dominant currently in the polls that the chances for the JR, the JRP to somehow revive their popularity, which was quite significant in the December 16 election, that's almost, that's almost assuredly not going to happen, and I'll say why in a moment. What could go wrong for Abe and the cabinet? Okay. First, a reversal of market sentiment. Okay. Abe has been, Abe's support rate has been flying upward based almost entirely, or at least with a lot of juice from the stock markets, uh, not, and they still have a long way to go. This is how this is the rise so far down here, and just look where we were in 2008. So there's a lot of room again upstairs for Abe and company to keep riding this wave of good feelings. My own personal view is, of course, that this is not based on any sense of value of Japanese companies, but instead is merely the result of monetary expansion. But nevertheless, it is playing very well with the public. The problem is, is I don't know if you can see it. I'm sorry, it's maybe too dim. This is the mother's market. This is the uh, very, very volatile uh, market involving entrepreneurial companies that's run by the TSE. It ha has already peaked out in January, so that we had a, a hyperbolic rise in the uh, stock market that then had a big crash immediately after January, and is again now creeping up back to its level. All the markets can do this, and it, there is still a few more months until the election. So that there could be a significant reversal in market sentiment, and that could play badly for the cabinet. Scandals. Scandals sank the first Abe cabinet. First, the uh, water purifier scandal of Matsuoka. Uh, the pension uh, records scandals, where 50 million pension records were misplaced. These are things that erupt 
and can debilitate a cabinet. I don't think that this, going, this is going to be significant for two reasons. One, we've already had a scandal. Uh, you may have missed it. Um, one of the members of the, of the uh, government had a woman problem. Instead of the situation where we had in 2006, 2007, for example, with Matsuoka, whose problems were dragged out and became the subject of deeply humiliating, eventually he committed suicide, uh, actions in the diet. We don't even know what the scandal was in this gentleman's case, and he's gone. It was dealt with like that, and taken out, before it became even a subject of conversation. The second interesting thing is, this cabinet seems to be bulletproof. <coughs> Since uh, this cabinet has been formed, Aso Taro, the finance minister, has made it practically a weekly activity to come up with something crazy to say. <laughs> uh, uh, we had the Italians spend money like it's water thing. Uh, all these very funny, oh, please hurry up and die. That was a good one. Uh, for the poor, that was for only for poor people, of course. Uh, rich people, you can pay your own way. But poor people, please hurry up and die because you're on the public dole. Uh, that kind of thing in the past should have been become more of a circus in, in, in the sense of the media jumping all over it, the public jumping all over it, the opposition jumping all over it. That hasn't happened. And if it hasn't happened with Aso, why would it happen with anyone else? I have a fear, feeling that the public has become quite inured, has become quite used to scandals, and that they don't have the juice that they used to have. International incident. I don't think that Abe and company are going to in any way do anything that will trigger an international incident. And the international incidents that have taken place over the Senkakas, for example, have not been government actions initially. They've been private citizens. And private citizens cannot be controlled and they can't be predicted. And the possibility of some kind of incident taking place and there being serious repercussions because we now have a much higher level of alert around the Senkaku Islands, that the possibility of a serious, serious incident, a damaging incident, is much higher. Internal dissension. Abe was elected not in the first round. He was elected after having been beaten in the first round by Ishibashige. He then, out of a LDP uh, habit, appointed Ishiba as the Secretary General of the LDP. Secretary General is in charge of personnel matters having to do with elections. So that Abe is going to go into the next election with people that Ishiba will be checking off. They won't be his, Abe will not be going in with his people. He'll be going in with somebody else's people. Uh, and that's the case where, he's, where he is now in terms of the membership of the LDP. The, the membership that's been chosen, the, the new freshman class, was chosen not by Abe's people, but by, his by the predecessor of Ishiba, Ishihara uh, Nobuteru. So they're really Ishihara's people. So there's really not a coterie of Abe people to rely upon when things get rough, which they may do after the House of Councillors election. Policy overreach. In this regard, uh, this is very speculative. Uh, but we have uh, in this, uh, well, in the tradition of talking about Abe Shinzo and the tradition about talking about Japan, an association of a rightward shift in Japanese public opinion with Abe's popularity or Abe's being in power. And if you ask a Chinese expert or a South Korean expert, they will tell you ad nauseum about the rightward shift in Japanese society going on right now. At the same time, the members of Abe's intellectual group, and that includes 
uh, writers like uh, Sakurai Yoshiko, uh, historians, all kinds of people who have been working together to put together a narrative about the right. These people are now saying, oh, finally, the public has come to us. The public is now seeing what we were saying for years and years and years. They have finally seen that we were right, and they've come to us. My sense is both those analyses are wrong. What I see happening is the Japanese public approaching the right-wing agenda and running right past it. You don't have to create a fantasy China threat anymore. There is a real one. And the public appreciates that, and the public is thinking about that. The right for many, many years, the, the fantabulous revisionist right, wanted to revise the Constitution, revise the history books, revise everything, so that people would wake up and see this new world that is so threatening. But the people, in my opinion, have woken up without all that, without the fantasy stories, without the fantasy China. They've woken up to a situation where there, is, there are threats around Japan and that Japan needs to defend itself, whether it is from North Korean nuclear and missile technology, whether it's from uh, various and sundry threats coming from China, that the people themselves have their own conception that has nothing to do with a rightward shift, as described by uh, other Asian countries, or a uh, coming home to our point of view, as described by the right. The question is, is once the House of Counselors election is over, Will Abe and his followers, persons like Education Minister Hakabun Shimomura Hakabun, will they suddenly shift, or try at least to shift, the discussion from this very moderate path that they're taking right now to a radical path of reviving the pre-1945 glory of, of uh, Japan? And if you think that that's some kind of story that I'm telling, please read the last three sentences of Abe Shinzo's new book, uh, Toward a New Japan. He tells you in exactly those words, this is not just a taking back of Japan from the Democratic Party's control, this is a taking back of Japan from the grip of, of post-war history. What is likely to go right for this, for the uh, cabinet and for the for the LDP? The uh, the DPJ seems to be brain dead. It seems to be unable to think of arguments to make about, for example, the supplementary budget bill. All it talked about in all the speeches was, public works are bad. Um, the public has gone beyond that conversation. The public sees fiscal stimulus as being something that has a mixture of different things in it, and public works is part of it. Public works is bad is from Koizumi Junichiro's time. It's from the DPJ of the 1990s. Why haven't you changed your story is the way most voters must be thinking about the DPJ, and certainly the way the media has been portraying the DPJ very negatively. a bypass JRA, JRP. The great uh, charm of Hashimoto Ishihara's party in the last election was its ability to be the non-LDP anti-DPJ vote. This was crucial, I think, to its ability to attract what was an extraordinary number of votes for a brand new party. If you look at the total votes, it absolutely stomped the DPJ in, in the proportional vote and did a very good fraction of what the LDP, an established party, did. Unfortunately for this new party, its issues are being torn away from it left and right by the LDP. Abe Shinzo is a credible right-wing force. He has a long history of revisionist and right-wing activities under his belt. There's, 
Ishi Hara Shintaro and Hashimoto Toru cannot compete in Abe's league. They are not comparable. Uh, Ishihara has been sitting out being governor of, of Tokyo, annoying the, the people who work at Skiji for a long time. <laughs> and Hashimoto is, is a TV personality and, and, and enjoys being on television a lot. But in terms of running things, he's, he's been popping around, and he's not going to be in charge or running for office uh, in this upcoming election. The LDP is stealing the issues, is stealing the image, as we saw in the... Uh, in the slide some time back, with the 43% popularity, or the 43% of those wishing to vote will vote for the LDP. They are chiseling away at this new party's support. It will, of course, have some support in the Kansai region because it's a regionalist party at its heart. But I don't think that we'll see anything like this ever again, where it is within a within a reasonable distance of the LDP. I'm sure that in the upcoming vote, it, the LDP will simply waltz away from everyone else. A proper policy mix. What do I mean by that? Abe Shinzo and his group represent a, a conservative government. Well, it's the LDP. All right. And yet, if you look at the situation here, and compared to the situations in the countries around the world, here a conservative government has the kind of economic policies that has people like Paul Krugman, a, a man whose blog's name is Conscience of a Liberal, absolutely slavering with joy. This is Keynesian economics, uh, Friedman monetarism, Everything, let's just throw everything we've got at the economy. We don't care about debt. We don't care about the yen falling in value. In fact, that's what we wanted to do. This is the policy mix on the economic side of the extreme left. At the same time, they can play on fears of change in the power structure of East Asia and have a credible argument and a credible record to run on in terms of their conservatism. This is a, a, a policy mix that you see nowhere else in the world, maybe somewhat in Berlusconi's party from Forza Italia, <laughs> where there's, there's this similar uh, economic package plus conservatism. But here in Japan, what do you need a left wing for? What do you need a DPJ for? The DPJ, in fact, does what conservative parties do everywhere else, advocate contractionary economics, uh, cutting of government spending, trying to balance the budget. Here we have a mixture found nowhere else that seems to be extremely popular. Whether it's tenable, whether it's something that can last, that's another question altogether. But this whole policy mix is about the House of Councillors election and winning the House of Councillors election. Finally, uh, my final point is about the third way. In December, I was asked by the Economist Group to participate in a, a panel discussion about the, uh, this was on December the 14th, two days before the election. And I asked about Abe Shinzo a question. And that question was, which month in 2007 did he learn from? Was it July? of 2007, when the LDP went to ignominious defeat in the House of Councillors election at, from an, a, an electorate that was sick of the scandals, sick of the way that the uh, Abe cabinet had comported itself, and also the LDP and the new Komeito inside the Diet simply passing everything using their majorities and stomping on every kind of decency in the process. The, the, the Republic responded by an extraordinary and unexpected no to the LDP and the Abe administration. Or did Abe learn from August, that next month, when he didn't go to Yasukuni Shrine? And it was a, a very interesting uh, situation. I don't know if you remember it. But 
they were be trying to be so accommodative toward China that everyone in the cabinet sort of said, okay, well, somebody else will go. And the, the cabinet had a meeting at noon, and they realized, looking at each other, that none of them had gone to Yaskuni yet. So they quickly bundled uh, Sanai tai, Taichi Sanai into a car. Uh, she was the ju most junior member of the, of the cabinet. Right now she's the policy research council head, but then she was just, and she was one of those, and this, and this, and this, and innovation, and this, and this, and this minister. So, and they sent her off, and she was the only cabinet minister to go that day. Because the Abe cabinet and Abe Shinzo himself had committed themselves to not provoking China, to not uh, taking positions that would upset the South Koreans. My feeling was that he hated that. And we have yet to hear yet about what he's going to do on August the 15th of this year. We don't know. And whenever we ask, he says, well, you know, that's something to be decided. Uh, my feeling is that given that he had a major breakdown the next month, that he really thinks that he has to be true to himself, that he has to be who he is after the House of Counselors election. But I'm, I'm thinking now that that question was wrong, and that vision was wrong, that there is a path between the two. That you don't have to be the, the slavering, right-wing person. You don't have to be the uh, accommodative person. You don't have to think about those things. You just have to want to win. And that seems to be what the plan is now. In terms of the vote, for the supplementary budget, reaching across the aisle to get a, bring a left winger into the coalition, something we did not expect and yet something that happened. In terms of, you know, standing up to China, we have press conferences, we have statements, but we don't have the promise to put personnel on the Senkakus. And by personnel, that means SDF forces, if you're, if you're confused about that. Uh, that. That has evaporated away. And instead, what we're, we have is a third possibility, where the LDP is being very, very accommodative, very kind and helpful. And at the same time, Abe Shinzo and company are holding on to their cards and waiting for a, 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 a better time rather than rushing forward and going into a, a uh, right-wing, if you want to call it right-wing, or revisionist uh, revolution, which was certainly what was the case in 2006-2007. My feeling is that despite my doubts, a long-time doubts about Abe Shinzo and the LDP, uh, that they're going to do very well in the upcoming election, and that things are possibly not going to change very much except for a Yasakuni visit after the election is over. Uh, that's all I have to say, but I look forward to hearing from, your, your, from you, uh, your own views and any questions. I only ask that uh, if you do have a point, Please be brief. There are a lot of people here and a lot of really, really smart folks who have a lot of intelligent things to say, and I'd like to hear from them. And if you take a long time, it'll be hard to work it all in. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much. We, we promised you a qualitatively and quantitatively large audience. As you can see, we have delivered. Uh, and I'm sure the questions will be worthy of Temple University. Uh, so uh, speak out or hold your peace forever. Uh, I always like to point out to our speakers that we have a very dynamic group that always likes, likes, likes to ask tough questions. So who wants to take the lead? If not, I will find a volunteer. Can we get, a, can we get an, a, a uh, microphone? Yeah, Siegfried and then here. So. Oh, yeah. If you could please uh, say your name, yeah. and if you have an affiliation, if you don't, that's entirely fine. Uh, if you have an affiliation, please shout it out. 
Yeah. So it's a pretty little freelancer from Germany. Uh, what will happen if uh, Abe uh, will try or the government will try to restart nuclear power plants? A very good question. Uh, one of the things that has been surprising in the, the post-December uh, 16th election is how quiet uh, the uh, debate on nuclear power has become. It seems to me that uh, the uh, entire issue has been handed off to uh, scientists and engineers to talk about, and that way the politicians don't have a responsibility as to whether a fault is an active fault or an inactive fault, which seems to be the major debate nowadays. Uh, that issue is being given to commissions, is being talked about by geologists and geophysicists. Until that issue is resolved about the geological strata underneath the, the nuclear power plants, which now, after the power plants have been built, are now a problem. Uh, that is uh, in a holding pattern. Will they restart nuclear power plants? Uh, that's not on the agenda right now, I don't think. If someone else knows better, please raise your hand. Hi, my name is Kai Katowicz. I don't have a, an affiliation. Um, when I read about uh, Abe's policies, I was kind of surprised, or I guess maybe not surprised, but, you know, um, yeah, building bridges to nowhere, how many more tetrapods do we need, and all, and all that kind of garbage that just has been repeated since the end of the war, but, um, so I, th I thought, oh, okay, this is, this is not, this is not so good, but then I read the Krugman, you know, I read Krugman just like you mentioned, and I said, oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense, too, um, and then you bring up how tenable, you know, is, it, is, is the policy, is his policy for, uh, rebuilding or economic policy actually tenable, and I mean that's the question I have for you. I suppose I'd like to hear more about is uh, does it make sense? Is it sustainable? Is it responsible? Um, you know, how, yeah, is it realistic? I'd be interested. Thanks. There is a school of thought that says it doesn't matter what happens to people who hold bonds; uh, they're going to be soaked no matter what. And uh, so, get it over with soon. Uh, that is something that I, at my age, worry about, and I'm sure persons who are older say, what, you're going to erode the value of savings, you're going to erode the value of the holdings of uh, pension funds, you're going to erode the value of the holdings of banks. That's the goal, that's the plan. Uh, I want out, but uh, the people of Japan are in. Uh, they're in completely, and they don't have much choice in the matter. Is it the right policy to debase the currency? Is it the right policy to uh, destroy the value of bonds? If you're a bondholder, yes, it is. And unfortunately, a lot of people are, and in fact, uh, most of the financial institutions are. They can't get, they, here's my, here's my point. They can't get out of their positions. An insurance company, which has a huge pile of JGBs, a bank, which has a huge pile of JGBs, can't sell them. Because if it, if it starts selling them, then its competitors will start selling theirs, and the entire market will collapse. So they're hostages of their own assets. They can't move. But what that means is that there's no price signaling going on inside the economic system that says, this is a good policy, this is a bad policy. When you have a system, we have a situation where prices can't tell you what's going on, you are, you're, you're, you're going into the dark. You simply have, have no feedback that will reinforce or undermine what your plan is. That's what I would say. Okay, more questions? Yes, here. Hi, Sarah Friedman, I have a translator. There has recently started to be uh, talk of price increases resulting from currency fluctuation. What is the potential for backlash there? Certainly, uh, if you watch NHK or TBS, 
on television in the mornings, you are going to be hearing a lot about that. Uh, that is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, it's a bit of a, a, a step outward for NHK, which of course is government uh, broadcasting, for it to go out and say, well, you know, prices of gasoline are going up, uh, is something that shows that there is a uh, serious possibility of there being an undermining of the government's plan. When uh, normally NHK doesn't move unless it has a pretty good sense that everybody's going in that direction. Uh, that everybody can understand this. However, uh, at the same time, uh, we have this uh, dissonance about equities prices are going up. Things are getting better. Uh, so to what extent those two different messages uh, in uh, cancel each other out, that's, a, that's going to be something that we'll be seeing, which is why a reversal of mar market sentiment, as I talked about, would be rather difficult to uh, overcome. They, they have the numbers in the government to pass any legislation. Let's, let's be serious about that. They have a supermajority in the House of Representatives. Uh, there's nothing, there's no bill that cannot be passed. Nevertheless, it will be uglier to pass things. It'll have to be by force. Not that force is anything that the LDP doesn't use anyway. Yeah. Hi there. Born and then got born and then yeah. Paul Scalise, an energy an energy specialist. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Dr. Paul Scalise. Stole my thunder. <laughs> uh, yeah, Paul Scalise, uh, Tokyo University. But let's hear what you think. The the budget for public works as a percentage of the total national budget, correct me if I'm wrong, last time was about 5% and falling. It's been falling for a very long time. Where, where do you see all this going now? Um, uh, how much they want to spend and what specifically they really want to spend it on? It, I mean, we hear a lot about bridges to nowhere and so forth, but do you get a sense for any one particular sector they want to spend the money on, they being the Abe cabinet? And, and, and how much money are we talking about? What, what do you think about where it's going to go from here? Well, you, you probably saw the uh, Reuters report looking at it. You know, how many airports is this? How many Kansai airports is this? Uh, uh, this these packages, especially for the package that's just been passed. And uh, you say, wow, that's a, that's a lot of money. But uh, you may remember with the collapse of the tunnel ceiling, uh, last year, the LDP immediately changed its song. And that's what, that was a major indication the LDP was really back on its game, where it had been talking about new projects and new things. Suddenly, we have a maintenance crisis in the country that has to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, if you didn't know, of course, that during the DPJ regime was the first time that maintenance costs surpassed new construction in the country's history. Uh, you would have thought, oh, the DPJ has been, has been cutting back on, on uh, maintenance. The exact, exact opposite happened. But the LDP quickly turned itself around, had a new story to tell. And my guess is that they'll talk a lot about putting things into the Tohoku, and they'll talk a lot about putting you know, repairs, which are needed. If you go to Akita Prefecture, if you go to any of the outer parts of even Tokyo's metropolitan district, the places are rusted out, they've got cracks in them. If you go on the, the freeway system within Tokyo, and if you look underneath, you say, great, I don't want to be on this road. Um, there's a lot that can be done, and if indeed, you know, I'm sure that there's going to be a huge amount of money that's going to be thrown at the Olympics. What, sorry, what was the number again? I have not got a number for you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, then, uh, Gabor, uh, he's standing up. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gabor Shepring from Hungary. Well, you know me. Uh, I have two questions and one remark. Uh, one question is, uh, you explained this sudden upswing in the, uh, the stock exchange and the index and the uh, 
the IX3 trade by the easy monetary policy. But uh, I think, in fact, the monetary policy has been quite accommodative even before uh, the prime rate has been in zero for, for a long while. Uh, there was a very robust asset purchase program by the DOJ even under uh, EPJ governments. So uh, maybe shouldn't there be uh, another explanation for this uh, uh, sudden change in the market uh, mood? Maybe some, I, I'm thinking of it should be some psychological effect. And my other question is uh, an easy one. Uh, what happened to his stomach ache? <laughs> is it gone or is it going to come back or maybe after July? And just a remark what uh, you said on the JGB market is uh, I completely agree, it's perfectly right. I forgot the percentage the, uh, of the total JGB amount, how much the financial sector is holding, which should be probably over 1%, so they are trapped. Okay. In, in terms of the, the, uh, the, uh, the internal bleeding that uh, he now says con was the reason why he quit, uh, but on the day that he did quit, never mentioned even once during a long press conference uh, where he had took questions back and forth about why he was quitting, never once talked about his health. Uh, he says he's got a new medication and it takes care of the problem. Uh, you know, we've never seen his medical records and we never will. Uh, and because of uh, Japan's uh, their, the uh, privacy laws, we'll never find out what happened really in uh, September of 2007. Because I don't know if you're aware of the privacy laws. Uh, it's not only illegal to tell things about people that are not true, it's illegal to tell things about them that are true. <laughs> it's often the worst for a lot of politicians. Um, if, if I tell you something that you didn't know before about, let's say, Mr. Dujari, he has the full right to sue me, even if it's true and I have documents proving it. And it, it is illegal for me to reveal a secret that is true. Article 4.2 of the Penal Code. <laughs> <laughs> it's a woman problem. <laughs> now, in terms of your first question, which I have to, you have to say, just give me a, a, what, what, what it was, because I, I have the memory of a flea. Uh, um, uh, monetary policy was loose even. Uh, oh, yes, the loose, the loose issue. Uh, Readers of my blog will, will know that this is my way I look at it. I see it as the greater idiot theory. Somebody else is going to pay more for this share of stock than I have paid for it. Because there's a whole bunch of dumb money that's going to come, not only from the monetary loosening, but a lot of people saying, Japan is back! Japan is back! I better invest! What can I buy? Um, and the smart money has already gotten in. You, we saw in, in the, uh, the arc of the mother's market, the smart money has already bid up the prices so that when the dumb money arrives, uh, it says, what can I get? And they say, here. <laughs> that's, and that is the laughing way of doing it, but that's, that's the way all stock markets win, run. They're all Ponzi schemes, really. You always buy something hoping that you'll sell it, either get a dividend, or sell it for more than you got. And you have to assume that someone's going to be dumber than you. <laughs> that's that's the, 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 the snide, snarky way of saying they're hoping for further rises from m money that's going to come in the future. OK. Uh, Gil, and then here, and then here, and then here. So Gil. Jill, still. Yeah. What would your advice to the DPJ be? What would your five-point comeback plan be? <laughs> Three-point comeback plan. How about just one? <laughs> <laughs> That is a very difficult question uh, because 
they lost all credibility. And you, it's something you can't work back or buy back or anything. Uh, when Noda gave up the last card that the DBJ had, which was redistricting the House of Representatives districts so that they would be more equal than they are now, that was the last thing the, the, the DBJ had. The one thing that they could still snap out at the LDP. He gave it away. He threw it away. And the LDP got, oh, we're going to cut five seats and we'll let the commission draw, redraw a few boundaries. But in terms of real redistricting, that, what, that, they threw it away. So what do they have left? Contractionary economic policy. Oh, that's a huge vote winner. <laughs> it didn't work for them in 2005 when uh, Okada was running against uh, Koizumi. He, Okada was so serious. We're going to be having such a miserable time. Everything's bad. We're in debt. We, uh, and strangely, people didn't go for that message at all. <laughs> uh, and that's the message that uh, the DPG w went into the election with. In, in December. We're going to be so serious. We're going to just, everything's going to collapse and, and, and we're going to be moral and, and, and we're going to raise taxes on you. I hope you like that. <laughs> um, I don't know what to do with a party that's, that's in a hole as big as that. And then now they have Kaida Bandi as its leader. Uh, we have a very interesting situation where we have not both of the major We'll, we'll talk about Hashimoto and Ishihara another time. But the two major parties have both had serious public mental breakdowns. Uh, for the, I've never seen that in Japanese politics before. But uh, you may remember when uh, Kan Naoto's policies made Bandi Kaida cry in, in, uh, in Daya testimony, and, and, and the, the, the LDP questioning him, saying, oh, don't, be, don't, don't, we understand. It's hard. It's hard to defend. The, the policies of Prime Minister Khan. It'll be all right. You think I'm kidding. You can actually go and see the video. And the, the, the LDP guy is consoling this minister, who's now the head of the party. Uh, you know, you asked him five points. Jeez. How about a hundred? <laughs> yes. Anyone? Yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, Christoph Neidert, I'm the correspondent of Süddeutsche Zeitung here. Yeah. And I've been here for 11 years. So I, uh, I totally agree with what you said about the stock market and the dumbest money is, of course, the foreign money which moves the, the, the money from abroad which moves the stock market. But uh, thinking of that, uh, I'm some, somewhat surprised that you think the stock market, the Nikkei, uh, influences uh, uh, the voter sentiment so much. I have covered many elections here. If you, if you go outside Tokyo, I've never heard, and if you look uh, what generations go to the polls, I've never heard anybody say, uh, I vote for this party or, or that party because the stock market does well. So why do you think the stock market is relevant for, for Mrs. Watanabe in Apita? A very reasonable question, which is the problem. Uh, it's not about reason, it's about image. It's not about something that's changing in Japanese, the Japanese economy. It's about what's on television every morning. It's up 100 points today. It's up 200 points today. What does that mean? Uh, and things are getting better. And it's just a message that is not something that the Abe cabinet itself controls, but nevertheless is supporting an image of things are getting better not based on structural change. People aren't investing in the stock market because they know now if they invest in a company that they can take control and take money that's being held in bank accounts and actually returning to the stockholders. You know, that dream that's never come true in Japanese investing. Uh, that's, not, that's not on the table. Uh, are we seeing a vast expansion of the Japanese domestic market with all these new consumers who are going to be buying all this new stuff made by these Japanese companies? No, that's not the story. What's the story then? Uh, you're right, the dumb money coming in. But nevertheless, it creates this beautiful image of an economy taking off. That's, what I'm, that's the reason why I say it supports the, uh, the message of the LDP. And the LDP is talking about it. You say, look, look at, look at what we've done. 
Look at, look at how much we've destroyed the value of the yen. Well, they don't put it in those terms. <laughs> uh, they say, you know, they say we're, we're fighting deflation. We're improving the profits of uh, exporters. But you know, they, and the funny thing is, and this is the what I think find fascinating, is that the government actually hasn't done a thing yet. Yes. <laughs> it's all based on sentiment. Yes. Yes. The 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 uh, two percent inflation target. Shidaka agreed to, well, we'll make a change in our behavior in 2014. <laughs> we're not going to do anything different this year. Oh, a few things, but the big, we're going to make the change next year. Or, in the case of uh, the fiscal stimulus package, nothing has been started. Nothing, there's no money going into the economy. Nothing has been planned out. It's the, the size of the package has been decided by the vote, but nothing has happened. And yet we have this beautiful morning report every day. Things are getting happier and brighter every day. If, uh, and, and this is the case with every government I've ever seen. You know, I, I you know, watched you know, Bill Clinton uh, do <laughs> fabulously because the stock market just kept going up and up and up. He wasn't in charge of it, <laughs> but it, you know, it made him look good. And, and he was more popular when he finished than when he started. Uh, that's not hard when, when you know, values of things are going up, no matter if there's eventually a crash. Uh, Stephen Harner, I do, uh, I'm a businessman, but I also write a blog called Wither Japan and Forbes.com. Uh, I'm very interested in, the, in policy uh, making and the influence of factions and factional leaders uh, within the LDP and in the cabinet, the real power and uh, influence of Aso and Ishiba and, and who else? I mean, who are the real movers and shakers? I mean, power brokers and, and, and actually the, the, those really wielding power apart from Abe or even maybe relatively greater than Abe within the party. The cabinet was uh, compiled, was uh, created out of Friends of Abe, which was the same as what happened in 2007, and the heads of factions. We have uh, Tanigaki at the, at the <coughs> Ministry of Justice. We have Aso. Uh, we have, uh, as uh, Vice President of the LDP, we have Komura, Ma Komura Masahiko, who is also a faction leader. Uh, this uh, knitting, knitting together of Friends of Abe and faction leaders is a, uh, probably one of the reasons why the, the uh, governance has been so stable for these first few weeks and months. Uh, that and having been in the uh, opposition for three years has made the LDP's uh, internal politics much more uh, quiet. Uh, it's, it's bad being in the opposition. No one comes to see you. Uh, and, and they don't want to go there anymore. And if they tear each other apart over factional issues, uh, that's going to be a problem. Where the, I don't see factions as being the, the, uh, the, the Cesara, the, the, the uh, dividing line. I see TPP as being the dividing line. That's going to be an interesting one. Abe's got a lot of momentum on TPP coming out of the uh, summit in Washington. Uh, and he's sort of become what he has to do in order to please Washington. Uh, but uh, so many of the LDP members are dead set against it, and not, not just going up to the House of Councils election where we have to win the agricultural vote. It's beyond that. It's, just, it's the way that TPP and other trade agreements would undo relationships between all these different entities uh, that, for them, is too much change, too much stress on the system. So factions, uh, no. I see, I see uh, the, di the division all along free trade or uh, the continuation of tariff and protection. Let's move forward to TPP. Do you think TPP has a potential to really break the... Abe coalition, I mean, 
How can we finesse this? That's the thing. Uh, the uh, agreement that was worked out is that Japan can enter into the TPP negotiations without having to commit to tariff reduction all over. And, and uh, yeah, fine. But if you ask the originators, the, the small countries of the Pacific that originated the TPP, what the TPP is about, they say, eliminating tariffs. That's what it is. That's what the job is. You know, that's the reason why we're having this agreement at any, for the first place. So we have a fudge in a, in a, that, that's going to get us through the next few months, but there's going to be a collision, and there will be a time to fish and cut bait. You know, so at that point, uh, my guess is that Japan will lock down. Is there, do you think, a leader of the anti-Abe faction on this TV who can, like, challenge him on this thing? You, you there's, no, there, there, there's no, that's an interesting qu question. I can't say that there's a, a major person within the LDP who is, the, the anti-TPP uh, people tend to be uh, second tier uh, level. The, the top level is still very much uh, tied into this concept of let's get through the election and let's not have waves internally. At least from my point of view. If someone knows better, please tell me. Thanks. Because that's a really interesting question. Well, my question. And uh, David Kaplan, just a long time resident here. Thank Simple you. question, maybe a difficult one. Which way do you see the end going? We've seen it go from 83 to 94 in a couple of weeks. And what's going to happen in the next few weeks? That's right. Uh, someone, someone is over here whispering. Uh, Where are interest rates going? <laughs> <laughs> interest uh, rates are you not cannot, You cannot, under any circumstances, sue Temple University <laughs> Japan, <laughs> any of, our, of the staff if you lose all your savings because you follow advice given at our sessions. I just want this on the record. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the economic theory would tell you that if you debase the currency, then the currency will fall at relative other currencies. Uh, however, uh, as the person over here was whispering, uh, if I knew, I would have already made the investment and I'd be cleaning up. Uh, so, uh, obviously I don't know. Uh, I'm obviously not smart enough to even try to guess, and I'm, I'm smart, but I am smart enough to not try. <laughs> Let me follow up, even though you're not going to try, is What's interesting is that, obviously, Japan an, is an exporter, but exports a percent of GDP are relatively low in Japan. About 16%. If yeah, you compare it, I mean, say, Switzerland has had a major problem with the euro, but for them, that's life and death, because Switzerland is a very small, open economy. So the value of the Swiss franc relative to the euro has an enormous impact mm -hmm. on every sector of the economy. Do you think that both Japanese investors, Japanese journalists, observers in Japan are still too focused maybe on the currency and not on other issues, in other words, <laughs> not realizing if a lot of Japanese multinationals that produce overseas and sell overseas, uh, that's not essential. I mean, if I'm manufacturing cars in Thailand, selling them in Southeast Asia, uh, I'm not that yen-based. But you are yen-based when you try to repatriate your profits. Yeah. And that's what has Toyota and other manufacturers dancing in the aisles right now and, and singing songs in praise of Abe. It's a magnificent. <laughs> but but you can buy fewer things. So details, details, okay. details. Because <laughs> I to, to me it seems a slight disconnect between the bigger picture and the focus on the on the thing. Well but certainly in Jinpan's energy bill is going through the roof. Uh, that man over there, with, with the funny man over there, I can tell you all about it. We've had, we've had him lecture so many times. <laughs> but we hope he'll be back soon. <laughs> My name is Sato. Uh, I'm a businessman, small yes. business owner. Uh, as one of the citizens of Japan, I like to point uh, just to point out a couple of things that you didn't mention. The first one is nobody, you know, expect Abe last year couple of months. I did. And so many other businessmen talk, already talked about the possibility, either Abe or somebody else. Also, could be the man. 
of that initiation. Initiation that made by the use of L young LDP members that they tried to kick out the elderly, you know, ex Mori type of the old type regime guys, and they didn't participate in the elections. So already they made the first victory. And also the good contrast with DPJ policies and the realization of the policies and the result are always compared by the new LDP. So that LDP, whenever they talk about the old result made by the DPJ, they are bucked up. That people's expectation, Japan now is far better than DPJ era. And I'm looking forward to see the landslide victory of LDP for the stability of Japan to the future in August, no, in July. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I could say is Abe has organized a very good regime. In other words, little number of idiots are there. While <laughs> the ex regime, DPJ, I could count 10 or 12. These guys and the ladies, uh, women politicians, are not seen in the current regime, which is a good sign, and also Abe educated well in his back history, that no say nothing is the best policy, and he keeps his promise not to say anything against the provocative actions, which is the first history in LDP's, let's say, 50 years one, since 1940 or the 1950s. So I admire Abe, and he's a good hope and I see no worries about the future of Japanese bond because it, Japan doesn't create the superinflation. And 90 yen or 100 yen, no, look at the 360 yen, that's the starting point. And we already experienced 120 yen. And since 1989, I knew the age and the days of 125 to 140 yen. We could survive. So we'll be okay. Do you see this? <laughs> I disagree on the bond issue. On the simple reason is that um, if you look at comparisons in terms of total indebtedness between uh, Japan and other countries in the world, uh, Japan's, for example, if you compare with the United States, the total stock of debt, and this is not just government debt, this is private debt, this is corporate debt, is about 300%, just under 300% of GDP. In Japan's case, total debt is over 600% of GDP. There is a limit to the amount of money that you can borrow even from your best friends. And in the case of Japan, everybody's borrowing from Japan. It's Japan borrowing from itself. But eventually, you're going to reach a point where someone's going to panic and say, it's not worth anything really. It's all just a dream. And when that happens, other people will be selling too and it becomes a panic situation. There's no way to hold on to that. That's one issue. In terms of seeing El Abe as a, a future, fine. Uh, there may have been persons who were doing that. Nevertheless, he didn't win among LDP members. He only won in the second round, and that was uh, basically because so many LDP diet members had been insulted by Ishiba over the years but from his telling them that he was smarter than they were. It's true that he is, but you don't tell people that. Uh, and Ishiba won among the local chapters. He stomped everybody. But when it came to the inside Nakatacho, then Abe became the man. And it was it was not as, you know, there was not this march that you're indicating of glory, that, that there were forces behind him and everything. It was, it, was, it was within a very, very narrow group of people that made this decision. And it, and it didn't reflect even the membership of the party. Let me, let me uh, take advantage of a chair to ask you a question following on, on Sato-san's uh, question about the quality of the cabinet. What's interesting is that I think we have, you told me this, I think we have nine members out of 20 or hereditary or something like that. Uh, how, how do we look at the impact of hereditary politics? I mean, how, how does this fit in, into your analysis? Because if there's one thing that makes 
you know, Japanologists always say Japan is unique for this, Japan is unique for this. In many, in, in most cases, it's not unique. You can find other countries, but there are very few mature, developed democracies where you have such a high rate of second, third, fourth generation politicians in senior positions. Um, how, how does this affect the system? I mean, what are your kind of your words of wisdom on heredity? I don't know about wisdom, but I can say these two things. We have a situation in Asia of extraordinary aristocracy. Uh, the only major head of state, or the two of them, that are not either the children or the, gr or the grandchildren of a former leader are the uh, president of, of Indonesia and uh, the president of Taiwan. All the other leaders, just, you know, if you go through the entire region, North Korea, son and grandson, <laughs> South Korea, daughter, China, son of the vi former vice premier. You go to the Philippines, son of a president. You go across to Malaysia, Malaysia, son of a premier. You go through the entire region, all the way out to India and Pakistan, uh, India, Pakistan, and all that. Everything is a family. So that 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 issue is something that is trans-Asian. It's not unique to Japan in any way. It's, it's the way things happen. And most of those countries are, are democracies. Okay, now that's point one. The second point is, I don't know, I'd love to condemn people who are born with a silver spoon in their mouths. I'd love to do it. Uh, because you know, I'm, I'm, I don't come from elite stock, and I'd like to be able to say, boy, that person just was born on third base and thinks he, he hit a triple. Uh, you know, but, but then I look, at a, at a politician like Koizumi Shinjiro, the young, Koizumi the Younger. <laughs> and you look at him and you say, God, he's got it all. And he's well-spoken. He knows what to say, he knows what to do, he does all the gestures. He went to the Shimane um, Takeshima Day. Nobody said, boy, he's a right-wing psycho. No, he's that's just what he does. <laughs> and I, my pers I have a personal story to tell about him. I was, uh, wait, where is, there's Hamza. It's the day when, when we went to the mountain. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we came back across on the ferry from uh, Chiba to uh, Kurihama. And we start walking through these deserted blocks, which are the uh, apartment blocks in which the self-defense forces and their families live in. In a, a really dismal looking place. And we walk, and there's, there are three people. There's a guy with a flag on his back. There's a really well-dressed young guy just talking to these blocks of, of apartments. No one else around. And then there's this very, very plain, really plain young woman passing out flyers, but there's no one to pass them out to. We were the only persons around. <laughs> that guy, the well-dressed guy, who was just going on and on and on, and for as long as we passed, we could hear him talking. That was, that was Koizumi Shinju. He did the retail politics that you need to do to do to win. He is a fourth generation politician. And he's only got two elections in the diet, and he's a force. And he's wonderful, and he speaks wonderfully. So I'd love to say, oh, they're all just, you know, you know they're, they're just carpet baggers that come here just to take all our money and, and go back to their mansions. But no, that's not the case. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, we will know that there are elections in Japan as opposed to North Korea. Um, <laughs> here. There are elections in North Korea. They're just not there. <laughs> okay, then here and then over here, yeah. Uh, is Hello? Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dave and I'm a comedian and I aspire to learn more about the kind of things you talk about so I can make fun of it. Um, <laughs> uh, the, I hope my question is not too simplistic. Uh, um, I was really surprised, unlike uh, Mr. Sato the, over there, who expected Abe to come to power. I, I was completely surprised because I thought, I, I had the feeling that the trouncing the LDP got by the DPJ in the previous election would have had some impact to sort of change the LDP's ways. Um, but it, I'm kind of confused now as to whether or not the current LDP, have they changed in any way as a result of that trouncing? 
or do they just kind of treat the last couple of years as some sort of just bad dream that they're trying to forget and their, their goal is to get 100% back to just where they were? So if you can enlighten me, what, sort of what, is there any impact from the trouncing they got? Have they learned anything or has any changed? Anything changed? Clearly, uh, Abe and his followers have learned uh, from the failure in the House of Council election in 2007. They do things differently now. Uh, but in terms of the LDP, your, your observation is absolutely correct. The LDP is an unreformed party. The, there was a reform group elected to take the party someplace new, and that was Tanigaki Sadakazu as the uh, president of the LDP, Ishiga uh, Shigeru uh, Koike Yuriko as the head of the, Somo, uh, the Somukai, and uh, Ishihara Nobuteru as the secretary general. In the case of, of Koike, uh, having her in head of the Somukai, Koike started out in the opposition, and she hopped along with Ozawa Ichiro from party to party to party, and eventually ended up in the LDP under the wing of uh, Koizumi Junichiro. Uh, why, how could she be in charge of the party's general council? Well, it's to liven things up, to make things different. They were ousted. They were tossed out. Uh, Tanigaki continued on with a new set of, of uh, executives that were chosen by the faction leaders, but nothing changed internally. And uh, yours is a, a really, it's, a, it's an observation that, that a few people have made, but it's nevertheless, it's a really a puzzle. Uh, my name is Gary McCaskill, um, Temple University student. Great. Um, I have a question. Uh, at the beginning of the speech, you said that you were skeptical of Abe. You said that. Sometimes they work when you hold them upside down. <laughs> <laughs> you said that. Um, yeah, it's on. You said that. Um, that you were skeptical of Abe when you um, at the beginning of the speech. Um, from the from the time that you began to now, are you still skeptical of Abe? And um, if not, I mean, have you changed your position on anything about about Abe? Certainly, I have. Uh, the uh, the courting of uh, <coughs> of uh, Tanioka Kuniko is not something the old Abe would have done. I just can't see it. I'm sorry, Sato-san. I don't think he had it in him five years ago. He was much more dogmatic, and he was not intent on winning the election so much as uh, justifying his grandfather's uh, political life. That seemed to him far more important. If you read Utsukushi Kunie, it's all about his grandfather and their plans and the, the story of his being ousted from making this great sacrifice in terms of the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance. That's, that was his dream five years ago. I don't think he has the same dream now. I think he likes to win. And that's something very new and very different. And it's good to want to win, because then you want to bring the people in. And you don't want to just do some action because you had promised it, but you try to figure out, okay, can I get the people along with me on this? Nevertheless, there are time bombs. Uh, his statement that he wants to release a replacement or a, a, a supplement to the, the uh, Murayama state. Murayama state. Hmm? Kono state. Oh, well, he also wants to do to the Kono statement, but more importantly, to the uh, statement that uh, uh, former Prime Minister, uh, the socialist former Prime Minister gave in 1995. Uh, 95 August? 94 August. 95 August. Uh, that statement on the end of World War II, of course it's 95, end of World War II, uh, 15th anniversary. Uh, uh, that statement of remorse, Abe has spoken out against it. He's spoken out against the Kono statement, uh, but he's backtracked on that and now says that the Kono statement was uh, 
a statement made by a key chief cabinet secretary. Kono never became prime minister. He was chief cabinet secretary when he made this statement on the comfort women, that there was such a thing. They did exist. Uh, and that there was US, uh, Japanese government uh, involvement in their recruitment. Uh, if you see the statement, it's, a, it's even more vague about this. It's really, really vague. To think that you wanted to make it even to retreat on it seems madness because it's the cover women issue is so much a part of South Korean identity. It's just something that they, they, they just go crazy over, and you don't. You have enough trouble with China. You don't want to have trouble with the South Koreans as well. Uh, and that's not for the, reason, the same reasons that Washington talks about this. Washington, D.C. has a very nice plan where it's expensive to have troops in Asia, so let's let Japan and South Korea work together to deal with East Asian security problems. And eventually, we'll be able to lower our, our, our profile. Uh, that's, that's the language that goes on. So there's a great deal of talk in Washington, D.C. of having South Korea and Japan have closer relations. Those two countries don't necessarily want to get along. Uh, I just don't see that. Uh, but there is a good reason not to, to uh, enrage South Korea. And that, that's one of the things that's in the cards. Thank you. Uh, Rob Leffler, uh, University of Arkansas, visiting at uh, Todai Health mm -hmm. um, You have uh, uh, given us a lot of uh, really entertaining and uh, um, insightful observations. And, uh, thank you. One of the issues, I think, long-term issues that Japan uh, is facing, and perhaps one of the most important, is population policy, an uh, mm -hmm. aging problem. Um, to many older people being supported by too few younger ones. And supposing that uh, your prediction is right and the uh, Jiminto wins an overwhelming victory this summer um, and is in a position to do pretty much what it will, um, I wonder if you could give us a little idea um, what the uh, what Abe's uh, regime might do with regard to two kinds of proposals that have been made to address population. Uh, one is immigration reform, and another is more family-friendly policies. In three minutes. In three minutes. <laughs> Have you spoken? Um, or, uh, kind of oh, well, there? certainly in terms of making it easier for women to work and have children, yes. And uh, they have appointed, visibly appointed, uh, <laughs> as the head of the Somukai, uh, Noda, uh, not Noda Yoshihiko, but uh, Noda Seiko. Seiko? No, no. Noda Seiko, right? Yeah. Noda-san uh, is famous for her struggles to give birth. Uh, she eventually has, she eventually did so. I, I don't want to go into that. Uh, no, it's, it's really a sad story. Uh, but she's now in charge of the general councils, and that appointment of this person who has gone through this personal struggle is very is very symbolic of, of an awareness of that. Uh, any demographer will tell you, eh, there's nothing you can do. Uh, there just aren't going to be enough 30-year-olds around uh, to give birth. And, that, and the reason why I say 30-year-olds is because people under 30 years of age aren't getting married, and uh, they don't have kids as much as they used to, uh, let's say, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, the, the childbearing years here in Japan start from 30, 35, and go into the 40s now. Uh, at least that's the way it is in Tokyo, and I have a post up which, which shows that uh, this week, uh, which got me in a lot of trouble with Hiroko Tabuchi at the New York Times. Uh, if, if she's here, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, she's not here. Okay. Uh, uh, if you're a friend of Hiroko Tabuchi, uh, I'm sorry about the word nonsense. Uh, <laughs> Maybe that was a little strong. Uh, but in terms of immigration, not even there. Uh, it's just, who are you going to invite? The Indonesians? Well, they've tried that with the nursing program. Uh, uh, doesn't work out. Uh, immigration of Brazilians, uh, that, that was a brilliant one. I mean, <laughs> no, it, 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 this, this is, luckily we're no longer in those days because it was assumed that since 
Brazilians with names like Tanigaki or names like uh, Suzuki uh, would be somehow easier to assimilate into Japanese culture. Uh, but they're Brazilians, for gosh sakes. This is the Samba people. What are you thinking? No, but they have surnames and they have, they have, you know, they have Asian features. So they'll fit in. Oh, my God, you have to be crazy to think that. Uh, but that's what they were thinking. Luckily, we're not in those days anymore. So there's not a, there's not a purely ethnocentric racial aspect to it. But nevertheless, uh, who are you going to go to? Um, my own feeling is there's going to be a lot of legal and possibly some illegal Chinese immigration. If you go around the neighborhood here on a Sunday, try to find someone working in a fast food restaurant or in a company whose name isn't Wang Chang or, or, or Dong. You know, <laughs> it, you're not going to find them. Uh, because here in this section of this city, on the weekends, it's a Chinese city. Okay? And that's going to probably be true more and more uh, in the future. But it's, it's something, of course, that if you put that out as, a, as, well, this is the way it's going to go, people are suddenly going to have, there's going to be a reaction to it. It's happening, yes. Chinese are now the largest uh, ethnic minority group in Japan. They've supplanted the, the Koreans. Uh, but it's not something that you can, that any government would ever talk about. Thank you very much. Uh, we promised you, you finish? You. I, I'm, I, I, it's 9 o'clock. Okay, you have to go so home. I, uh, <laughs> no, I, I don't want to interrupt you in mid-sentence. No, we don't want to be too barbarian. Uh, but thank you very much. I, I promise the best. And one uh, question that arises, and I'm not going to ask you to, to, to answer it. You, you mentioned that you know, Abe's instincts, obviously, to go to Yasukuni, to do all these things, but you know, his intellect tells him to do something different. And so far, he you know, hasn't gone to Yasukuni. What I find interesting is, when he was in Washington, um, he mentioned he was he welcomed the election of President Park and noted um, that uh, his own grandfather uh, had been a good friend of President Park's father. And obviously, if you're somewhat familiar with Korean history, Korean politics, uh, <laughs> you know that a Korean politician whose father was an officer in the army of Manchukuo, uh, who liked to sing Japanese songs. Uh, and apparently was a good uh, friend of a former member of General Tojo's cabinet, it, it's not something you want mentioned. I mean, it's not how you want to be introduced. <laughs> but what I find interesting is that clearly he was totally unaware of it. I mean, I don't think this was a calculated trick to hurt President Park. Uh, so I, I think it's, it, 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 it will be worthy to see how his heart, his intellect, and his knowledge of history uh, all combine uh, <laughs> to um, lead Japanese foreign policy uh, in one way or the other. So I think that would be very interesting to follow. Um, but I thank you again. Uh, we we're extremely <laughs> grateful to you. Um, we, uh, our, our goal at, at Temple is to provide high-level intellectual entertainment. Uh, and that's exactly what you have done. Uh, no, we don't want, no, it's in the evening. No, we don't want some boring guy who's reading his PhD dissertation and talking about the great footnotes he has added. Uh, but on, on the other hand, we don't want someone who doesn't know his stuff. And you both know everything, and you're very good at telling it. So we thank you very much. Uh,